We've gone through the uh, series we just started on Daring to be a Daniel. You remember we saw the first week on how to raise a Daniel. And basically, you know, we, we want people to uh, lead that way. And there's certain things as parents and grandparents we have to do. Then last week we started off with the Daring to be a Daniel himself. In chapter 1 we saw that he was a man of conviction. And uh, because he was a man of conviction based on the word of God, we started to remember he was only roughly 17 years of age. He's taken travel that many miles away. You think about it, you know, how many days alone it would take to get there. Thought of ever going back home uh, with Slim and none, but she never did make it back home. And so you think about it, so he was a man of conviction, so he did a lot of wise choices. If you remember who he chose to follow the word of God, he chose to, uh, to stand up for a lot of different things. He chose good friends. He chose to, uh, uh, to separate himself, different things like that. So being a man of conviction, we have to do the same based on Scripture. And so what happens when those type and things happen to us, we have to have the conviction already in place and the reason you can't be thinking about it when it happens or it's too late. So to, uh, in chapter 2, we're going to be looking at another one. I think it's another great attribute that Daniel has, and one that we don't often see in a lot of people. You see it in some of your great men and women of Scripture, Remember one of the greatest quotes I think of in Scripture has to do with Moses. And remember, Moses made has made the statement he was the most what humble, humble man to walk the face of the earth. I mean, you think about it. Joshua comes after him, but Joshua uh, never uh, was was with God face to face. How do you think you lead that many people and you're walking face to face, but you can be humble? You led that many people out to freedom but you're, you're humble. And so I think it's important to recognize humility. The same thing can happen, you remember, with uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians uh, 12, he was given the thorn of the flesh to keep him humble because of all his revelation. But it's interesting, and Paul says, I am the chief among what? Sinners. I am the least of the apostles. Humility is something that is so seldom seen, but is so greatly desired. Well, you're going to find humility, I believe, in chapter 2. When it comes to Daniel, so let's think a little bit about it. The uh, talking about humility, and one reason why we need it, even like with what we're talking about with, uh, with Bonnie or all the rest of these, in James chapter four and verse six, it says, "God resists what proud, proud and gives grace, grace to do." So if we're asking for grace, and we're asking for different things, <coughs> but we are a proud person or a proud people, we're not really wanting God to do anything. The same thing happens in the Hebrews 4 we saw earlier. If we're going to and receive grace and mercy, but we are a proud people. It's real similar to me. If you remember when the, uh, the uh, leader, the uh, Gentile leader's child was sick and the Jewish leader said to him about the Gentile, basically he deserves to be healed as, as child does because of what he's done for us. And what did he say? I am not worthy. So a big difference, I think, is he was humble and wanted grace. The people thought he deserved it. So when we go, we need to be humble. So let's think about exploring the past. Go to chapter 1 and remember a couple of things. You remember in verse 6 and 7, I think it's important to recognize is the fact that his name, all four of their names were changed. And the reasoning for that is you remember, basically, Nebuchadnezzar is saying, our God is better than your God. We conquered you, and if you were that strong, then your God should have protected you. And I don't want to call you, and every time I call you, all four of them were named after Elohim or after Yahweh, based on their, their spelling. I don't want to have to be saying Yahweh is God, so I'm going to say that uh, one of my gods is God. That's why you have Belteshazzar and you have Shadrach and so on. He's naming after his gods. So I don't... Thinking, when you're thinking about it, remembering the past and then you remember the uh, different things, the importance of recognizing we are in a spiritual battle. Even in the middle of naming, there is a spiritual battle going on. Now, would you agree, according to Ephesians 6, we are in spiritual battles? So does that mean that Daniel is in a spiritual battle and God is using him with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar thinks I'm the greatest and my God's the greatest and God's saying, no you're not. But if he uses you, how many of us are going to get prideful? So let's think about it when you look at this. 
Notice the second thing I think is notice recognizing your ability. Notice in chapter 1 and verse 17, and then also notice in verse 20. 17, and as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge, intelligence, in every branch of literature and wisdom, Daniel even understanding all kinds of visions and dreams. And then in 20, as for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them to be ten times better than all the magicians, conjurers, in his whole realm. Okay, so you're talking about roughly 20 years of age, and they're ten times better than everybody else. Now, they had ability. As we already saw, you remember in chapter 1, they were chosen because of their ability. But God gave them special ability, and as Daniel was writing back over 70 years later, he's saying what? This ability came from who? <coughs> How many times do people take credit for things they shouldn't be and they should be giving God the praise for things? So think about it. He's recognizing his uh, deal. So I want to ask you a question. Do I give credit to the abilities he's given me? How often do we give God credit for abilities? Could he take those abilities away? I know that's one of the concerns I know with Debbie before. You know, she was wondering if she'd ever be able to sing again. I'm sure that's a question she's going to have now. Because, you know, it took a long, it took a while, and, you know, those are issues that you have and you ask. He, he gave it to you the ability to do it. So I think about it. Notice then recognizing man's place. And so in chapter 2, you basically, it's an interesting when you look at the background. It says, in the second year of the the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed and his spirit was troubled and sleep left him. Now jump to verse 3 for a second. Notice it says there, and the king said to them, I had a dream. So the dream is singular, but apparently he has it over and over again. So we're talking about, don't know how many days or how many months this took place. He'd have a dream. A week later, he'd have a dream. Same one. A month later, has the same dream. So he's coming to the conclusion this is something pretty significant. According to Hebrews 1, in the Old Testament, God revealed himself through dreams and other things. You have the same thing with uh, Joseph, you remember, in Genesis 41. So here you have this dream. He keeps coming back, and now he sleeps leaving. He doesn't know what it means. He keeps having it. So that's you think about it. The request then in verse 2 down to verse 6, and for the sake of time, he asks all his religion, uh, his leaders, Tell me the dream and tell me what it means. Now, he doesn't tell them what the dream is. Now, the reason he doesn't is because in verse 7, and it's interesting, we'll look at it. Remember, he's telling them, okay? It'd be like me telling you, I had a dream last night. Uh, who can tell me what I dreamt? Yeah, at least he's looking at me like, yeah, all right. Okay, that's what he's asking. Hey, I've had a dream, I've had it over and over again. Now I want you all to tell me what I dreamt, and not only tell me what I dreamt, but then I want you to tell me what it means. It isn't because he's forgot the dream, I don't believe. It's because, you notice in verse 7 and 8 and 9, why? Because if he tells them the dream, notice what he's afraid of. You notice in verse 8, the king answered and said, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time in so much as you have seen the command for me is firm. That if you do not make the dream known, there is only one desire to create for you. For I be, you have agreed together to speak lying, corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. So they don't know. And they've already conjured up of what the answer is going to be. And they're all in agreement. And they're going to lie to him. So he says, I know that's what you're going to do and what you already decided. So I'm not going to let you do it. You're going to have to tell me what I do know then I'll believe what I don't know. I think it's important. Tell me what I do know, and when you tell me that, then I know that there's something here. Then I'll believe what you don't know. And I think that's an incredible test when you think about what they're up against. So you think about it. If you were these leaders, what would you think of? And by the way, how old is Daniel right now? 18, 20. Okay, 20. Roughly, because we don't know how long, how, his dream started in the second year, but how often, how long before he does, and this comes forward. So, you think about it, you're a teenager, how many of you want to go before 
President Trump and say, all right, I've had a dream. Tell me what it is. <coughs> An interpretation. You know, it's not like we're at, at, in older and we're a little more established. He's a young individual thinking about it. As you think about it, here's his reasoning. So you notice then what takes place. It's interesting recognizing the deal. So they you know, request, and so obviously he's going to put them to death. And uh, what's interesting when you get into 12 and 13, Daniel and his four friends separated himself, so they didn't know about the decree. They're part of the wise men, but they don't associate with the Chaldeans and so on. They have, their, they have their gods, their demons, and all the rest, and they don't associate with them. So they haven't heard this decree. All they get is a knock on the door and the bodyguards coming to go lead them off to kill them. Now how would you feel all of a sudden you open the door and there's a guy saying, I'll lead you off. What for? Because you didn't interpret the king's dream. And tell him what it is. What dream? Now you're seeing where, but notice why was Daniel and his four friends? Because they're separating, just like they did in chapter 1. They are, their power is not coming from the same source that the Chaldean power, and they want to make sure people recognize we don't serve their gods, we serve the true God. So you think about it, what you have, then he requests time. Notice in verse 14. It's amazing here, you talk about 20 years of age, roughly, 21. Daniel replied with this discretion and discernment to Ariok, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men. It's amazing to me, here's you put three years of training and food and everything else into all these people and because they can't answer an impossible task, I'm going to wipe out all the wise men in all the land. That's going to leave you with what? Nothing. I mean, this, it's just you know, how valuable is human life? It is to make you think about it. Okay, if you can't give me what I want to hear, I'll, I'll wipe all of you and I'll start all over again. So notice he's asking for time. And notice what he does. He, and he informs him in verse 15 what it is. So Daniel, in verse 16, Daniel went in and requested of the king that he be given time in order that he might declare the interpretation. Again, I don't think we take it, we take it for granted. How hard is it for you in those days, thinking about the, the story of Esther, how easy is it for you to walk into the king's presence? If you don't walk in unannounced and so on. So here you think about it. You're 20 years of age. Now the king knows who you are because he's tested you. But how many others? Now you're going in and you're saying, notice what he said. Give me time so that I can and I will interpret. Now what kind of walk of faith is that? Does he recognize the impossibility? He recognizes the impossibility you see later in chapter. You give me time, and I'll do it. But the reason I'll do it, the reason I'll be able to do it is because of who I serve. I know I can interpret this not because of me, but because of who I serve. So you think about the humility that he has. It's quite amazing when you think about it. So he then, notice then, I think it's interesting too, then notice in verse 18, what you have, Daniel went to his what? Where did he go? Friends, but where did he go? Where are his friends at? Thus, does it say in verse 18, in order that, you know, in, in 17, Daniel went to his house. You ever have to stop and think? Daniel owned a house. It's established. They're in, you know, they're in a foreign country, but they, he's moved up to have a house. His three friends are there. All four of them are going to be killed. Notice what they do in verse 18. They requested what? Compassion. How many of us would be requesting compassion and how many of us were making some demands of God? He's gone through all this training, God spared him, he's giving him all this ability, and he could be killed tomorrow. He doesn't say, God, you you know, you owe this to me, I've done all this for you. He's asking for compassion. Humility. I don't have the ability. I need your help. So it's interesting. And apparently that very night in verse 19, we don't know for sure if it was that night or others, then the mystery was revealed. Now if the mystery was revealed to you, what would you do? Let's say the, the mystery was revealed to you at 5 o'clock this morning. What would you do if you're like me? 
I would be in my vehicle and I'd be driving 100 miles an hour to the palace and be knocking on the door and saying what? I got it. I got it. What does he do? He, he doesn't tell anybody first. He goes and he thanks the Lord. It's interesting when he thanks the Lord and he gives God all the credit. Who He raises kings, he lowers kings, he does all these things. But notice it's interesting in verse 23. To thee, O king of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for thou hast given me wisdom and power. Even now thou hast made known to me, what does it say? We. What we requested of thee, for thou hast made known to us. It's interesting, he gives credit to the three friends who are there praying to. It's not just, you made it known to me, yes. But we all were praying that you would. They deserve just as much credit. And how many times are we giving credit to people who need to be given credit for? Or we take all the credit for ourselves. It's interesting. He stops immediately and thanks the Lord. He then thanks the Lord for their prayers and recognizes it is all of us praying. It's not just me. You gave me the answer. But it's because of all of us praying. And I think it's important to recognize that. And he, it's interesting, 70 years later, when he's writing this, he recognizes what? It is all of them doing that. Think about it, then you go on. Notice, I think it's interesting when you think about it. And you question, and I'll notice the next one before we do it. Notice the 24. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and spoke to him as follows. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me. In the king's presence, I'll declare the interpretation to the king. Then Arioch hurried and brought Daniel in the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. Listen to this carefully. I have found a man in the exile. He's taking credit for what? Hey, I found him, man. You know, give me credit. Look, I found a guy I can. No, he didn't. Who went to him? Daniel went to him. So a question that you ask yourself, I think about it, am I like Daniel to give God the credit do him? Am I like Eric to take credit for something I didn't do? You ever worked at places where people take credit for something they did nothing about? How many times were you working on vehicles or you're working on like having equipment and you can't figure something out and you pray and God shows you and then the person comes in and, they're, and uh, something's fixed or whatever and you take credit for it? How many times have we turned around and saying, you know, I was stumped. I'll be honest with you. And I prayed and God showed it to me and we fixed it. Then who gets the credit? It can happen to every single one of us and does. Are we giving credit when it should be? Humility. Yes, God showed it to him. But he makes sure. But notice then the other one is running up there and I'm sure he's hoping to get rewarded for it. Notice then, I think it's interesting, he and when you go down through this, he then is going to re reveal it to us. It's kind of interesting. He reveals the history of uh, what's going to happen to Israel, the Gentile nations, which is again in Luke 22. And there will be four nations, four great empires before uh, Christ comes back. You're going to have, and he will reveal it later. You don't want to look at it today. But he'll, you're going to have the meat. Uh, first you have Babylon, the head of gold. Then you're going to have the Medes and Persians, which he'll talk about in 7 and 8 chapter. And then you're going to have the uh, Greece, going to talk about later and then you're going to have the Roman Empire and then at the end of this same passage it says that Christ comes back and destroys it. So when people have talked about I never forget when I was growing up people talked about communism was going to take over the world. How many of you remember that? Not possible. Not if you read this text. The last empire is the revived Roman Empire that God destroyed. Not communism. I've heard it recently too that Islam is going to take over the world. No, nope, not possible. Not if you read this passage and the ones in this book. Now they can take over a lot of things. They can do a lot of good things, but they will not take it over because the revived Roman Empire is who Christ will eventually come back and destroy. Now that those nations are going to be put back together and so on, and we find that in the Book of Daniel. But it's interesting when you're saying all this. How much of a head could that be, put you if you reveal all this stuff? And he's humble. He tells people. Now it's interesting. You remember the the religious leaders of the day said what? Nobody can tell the king 
this. In fact, if you look at it in verse 11, more of the thing which the king demanded is difficult. There's no one who can declare it to the king except God's, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Their answer is, hey, only God's can do it. God doesn't be, he's not down here talking to human beings. He can't do it. So notice the battle that's going on, so he's not going to reveal it to him. And he now tells him a dream. Obviously, by telling him what he dreamt, he knows he's telling the truth. He then tells them what the answers are and what's going to take place. And so it's interesting when I like to think about it when you go down to uh, in verse 27, 28, when he, he's recognized. Remember, he recognizes his place, but he recognizes God. And notice he says, Daniel answered the king, as for the mystery of which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conquerors, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. Now, if he stopped right there, what would happen? He'd be killed and he'd be the first one killed. Notice the next statement. However, there is a God who in heaven reveals mysteries. He has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while you're on your bed. He didn't tell them. So what is Daniel saying? Remember, he changed his names because our gods are better than yours. His leaders said, hey, nobody can do this but the God. And now he's saying what? Your people and your gods can't do it, but my God can. Notice Nebuchadnezzar recognizes that too because notice his answer in 46. Remember, you think about it, the leader of the world at the time. King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, did homage to Daniel. Now, that's amazing. Why would he, the king of the world, fall on his face before Daniel? Is not Daniel his slave? Because he recognizes Daniel is linked to who? To God. Notice what he said. He gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrance and incense. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and Lord of kings, revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery to him. Because Daniel gave God the credit, Nebuchadnezzar gave who the credit? God. And he recognizes that his God is better than the one he had been worshiping. And he won't come to know uh, salvation until later. Uh, I believe he will later. Uh, not yet. But he's working. But again, I think it's important. God can use us, even terrible and tough situations, to be bringing people to him. Our job is to reveal and trust God and reveal what God has told us. So think about, about these different ones. It's interesting when you go on now, and you uh, think the next one, you're recognizing the true God, but in 48 and 49, he uh, remembers his friends. Notice then Daniel, our king, promoted Daniel, gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over the wise men of Babylon. How well do you think that went over? But notice 49. Daniel made a request to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon while well, Daniel was at the king's court. Did Daniel remember who helped to pray? For the answer. Unlike Joseph in Genesis 41, did the cupbearer remember Joseph? No. Daniel remembers. When he gets promoted. He wants to tell the king, hey, yes, the answer was given to me, but it was given to me because the four of us pray. And if I'm exalted, they should likewise be exalted because of what they did. How many times are we giving people credit and praise for the parts that they do? How many of you have been with in bosses when they give you credit for things that you do, whatever part it might be? And how well does it work and how well do you want to work for them? So I think it's an interesting what often doesn't happen. Let's think about some applications and, and then we'll close. The uh, one of them, am I like Daniel and I give credit to him or am I like Eric and I'll take credit for something I didn't do? Am I pointing people to God or accepting praise what happened to Herod when he wouldn't give praise to God and he got eaten up with worms did he not 
Do I remember and reward those who helped me along the way, or am I like the cupbearer to Joseph? And the last one, am I willing to be used of God as his representative in spiritual battles around me? Did Daniel ask for it? But was he willing to serve where he was? And he goes from chapter to chapter to chapter, and each time there's a new battle, there's something new. So he won this battle, now in chapter one he had one, chapter two he has one, next week we'll have another battle. Constant battles you're going through. Just like we can. Just like we can. Just like we can.